Welcome back to Long Crime Network. I'm Stacey Delicat, and thanks so much for being with us this afternoon. It is a busy day here on Law and Crime. If you've been watching, you know we have been following the Jason Van Dyke sentencing out of Chicago all day long. That will resume in just about 30 minutes. But I want to run you through the other big cases we have our eye on here. Of course, the McStay family murders. If you've been watching, you know we've been on top of that case. California versus Charles Merritt all week. Court is dark today. It will resume Tuesday after the Martin Luther King Jr. Day uh, holiday. Meantime, Jeremiah Monell, the case out of New Jersey, remember Monell was on trial for uh, brutally stabbing his estranged wife, Tara O'Shea Watson, to death. Well, today a jury did find him guilty of murder and guilty on weapons charges. Uh, that happening earlier this afternoon. Monell set to be back in court for sentencing on March 1st. In our other case, Ohio versus Claudia Herrig, she is the woman who was accused of murdering her husband, an Air Force veteran, Carl Herring. Well, the state rested in that case today, and on uh, Tuesday, we expect the defense uh, will begin their case, and that will continue. That's where we are on those cases. But now back to the sentencing phase for Jason Van Dyke, the Chicago police officer who was convicted for murdering the black teen Laquan McDonald, shooting him 16 times. Uh, uh, today is his sentencing. The fact that he was found guilty last year was seen as historic because a Chicago police officer has not been found guilty of a murder um, in decades. Now we are waiting to see how he will be sentenced. He does face a maximum of 96 years behind bars, uh, possibly e even more than that if, if the judge so decides in this. Of course, his attorneys have asked for a much more lenient sentence. Let's run through uh, what we have heard so so far, again, the judge calling a recess just a uh, short while ago, but court will come back at 3.30. At that point, the defense will bring on their witnesses, and we will see whether or not Van Dyke himself will give a statement to the court. But so far this morning, we heard from four witnesses who all say they had bad encounters with Jason Van Dyke over the course of the last... Uh, 10, 15 years or so. These were uh, four different men who we heard from, uh, many of them who were pulled over uh, by Van Dyke, who claim he hurled racial slurs at them, who claim that uh, he injured them, he roughed them up. In fact, one of the men successfully sued Van Dyke in federal court and won a $350,000 verdict. Let's get started uh, by recapping the highlights of the testimony of Vidali Joy. He is a man who was pulled over by Van Dyke. All right, so those were the highlights of the testimonies from these three witnesses, three men who all claim they had very negative encounters with Jason Van Dyke in past years. Uh, the first witness said when he was pulled over by Van Dyke, Van Dyke held a gun to his head and uh, yelled racial obscenities. The second witness says that he was choked by Van Dyke when he was stopped for something, uh, that Van Dyke tried to choke him to get a cough drop out of his mouth. And then that third man said uh, he, the, that Van Dyke and the other officers officers were really unprofessional uh, when they pulled him over, uh, started he had rolled through a stop sign, but they started questioning about murders in the area. Uh, clearly the, the prosecution uh, setting up a pattern here. Let me bring in my guests now, Roger Foley, criminal defense attorney, and Marnie Jo Snyder, also criminal defense attorney, both joining me via Skype right now. So um, Marnie, I'll start with you. Is this an effective way to sort of set up uh, witnesses to show a pattern of behavior by Van Dyke? produce a pattern of behavior that, you know, he's had a long career, and three is not uh, an overwhelming number. However, take him out of that good apple category and put him into the bad apple category. So it can alleviate oh, the guilt that the judge might be feeling over having to sentence someone who served the community in some capacity, because they're showing this isn't the person that deserves your respect, and this isn't the person that deserves your sympathy. You know, some people have wondered, um, Roger, you know, that last um, witness, when he was asked to identify Van Dyke, pointed to him, said, that's him in the jumpsuit. That's where he belongs in the prison jumpsuit. Uh, why he is wearing the prison jumpsuit as opposed to a suit or something this time around. It, uh, can you weigh in on that, Roger? It, I mean, obviously inappropriate, but that young man's belief that he had been terrorizing the, the black community in particular, obviously talks about racial overtones. Uh, putting guns to people's head, choking individuals on, on routine traffic stops. 
Um, obviously, that that's the belief, and, and obviously it's, it, it is accurate. Not necessarily appropriate uh, the way he said it because he was just asked to, to point out an ar article of clothing so they could identify him as the person who did it. But um, his opinion, and, and rightfully so, I think many people believe. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to hear from those same three witnesses on cross-examination, what the defense said to them. Stay with us. We'll be right back after this quick break. All right, so I'm back live now with my guests, both criminal defense attorneys, Marnie Jo Snyder and Roger Foley, both joining me via Skype. Uh, we were just talking about whether these witnesses were effective in sort of uh, painting a picture of Van Dyke's uh, character as an officer, how he interacted with black men. Uh, Roger, how do you think the defense did in terms of trying to discredit these witnesses and uh, poke holes in their stories? I, I think the defense was making a good point, especially on that first witness, uh, where they were indicating, hey, you, you never said anything. You never put in your, in your report when you signed an affidavit indicating what this officer did. You didn't say he put a gun to your head. You didn't say that he, he, uh, he barked racial slurs at you. So um, I think that was pretty effective with that witness. Uh, uh, Marnie, do you agree? I do. I think that with the fact that something like that wasn't in the report was good. The thing that's the saving grace for the prosecution is that they're not trying to prove that those things happened uh, beyond a reasonable doubt. They're trying to show that uh, Officer Van Dyke was not a model officer and that he may have had racial bias and acted on that racial bias before he gunned down and murdered Laquan McDonald. You know, you mentioned they're not trying to prove a reasonable doubt, right? This isn't the trial. There's no jury here. They're trying to uh, convince a judge one way or the other how Van Dyke should be sentenced. I'm wondering, how do you think testimony like this plays to a judge versus a jury? You know, we had that last witness saying, oh, he was pulled over. He felt like he was pulled over just for being a young black man in America. You know, that's something you could see, I think, resonating with some jurors. But a judge, you know, a seasoned judge, um, how does testimony like this, you think, really um, play to him? Marnie? I think that the judges uh, need to kind of start thinking along the lines of learning how to believe uh, people who are young black men who talk about these things. I mean, the judge was there when this jury convicted Officer Van Dyke. And so the idea that he would have gunned down a child also wouldn't have been uh, something that, that this judge might have necessarily believed before the jury said it. And so I think that it's important for them to be open to listening to these people that are testifying the same way they would be open to hearing from a victim's family. All right. Thanks to both of you. We're going to take another quick break. When we come back, court set to resume in just a few minutes. We will take you there live. Stay with us. Any minute now, the sentencing phase should resume in Chicago for former Chicago police officer Jason Van Dyke um, watching the feed, and we should get a live picture back momentarily. In the meantime, while we wait for that, let's check in with Aaron Keller to see what's uh, coming up later on today on the Daily Debrief. I know you've got a full show. You're going to be all over Van Dyke, but uh, lots of other stuff besides that. Hey, Aaron. Exactly, Stacey. It's been a busy day here on the Law and Crime Network. We're going to first start with the Monell verdict. This is the case where... A son in New Jersey got up on the witness stand, pointed to his father and said, yes, that's the guy who killed my mother, and I saw it. The defense strategy to point to unknown DNA, to point to some other what-ifs in this case, really was not able to overcome that. So we're going to break down that verdict. Also, we're monitoring the situation in the Claudia Herrig case out of Ohio. This is a case of a woman who's accused of killing her military husband by shooting him a number of times. She fled to Brazil along with his money, but there are a lot of twists and turns in this case, including a suicide contraption that some federal agents were talking about. We'll tell you how that plays into this already bizarre story. And as you said, Stacey, we're continuing to monitor the situation in the Jason Van Dyke sentencing. I know they're going to be back any second. 
We will be monitoring that for a verdict, as I know you will as well. So, Stacey, back to you. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Sounds like a great show. We look forward to it. Well, we are still standing by for court to resume now, at which point the defense will begin its case. We expect we will probably hear from some of Van Dyke's family members, perhaps Van Dyke himself. Uh, that is the big question, though, uh, whether or not he will speak. In the meantime, we talked about some of the witnesses that prosecutors called earlier today to talk about their really negative, scary encounters that they said claimed uh, scary and disturbing encounters with uh, Jason Van Dyke. Uh, but there was a fourth man we also heard from who got especially emotional. This is Edward Nance. He was pulled over by Jason Van Dyke. He claims Van Dyke pulled him out of his vehicle, grabbed his arms, uh, slammed him on, uh, onto his car, pulled his arms behind his back and cuffed him. This man claimed he suffered uh, such bad shoulder injuries. He had to have multiple surgeries. In fact, he sued. And in a federal lawsuit, he won $350,000. Uh, let's hear now from him about how he described those, that uh, encounter with Van Dyke. All right, welcome back to Law and Crime. So the Van Dyke sentencing hearing is continuing. However, the witness currently on the stand does not want to be broadcast. She doesn't want audio of her testimony out. And we are hearing from reporters in the courtroom that that is Kaylee Van Dyke, uh, who is the oldest of Jason Van Dyke's daughters. Uh, she's 17. Uh, she's on the stand. She said that she will read the letter she wrote to the judge, one of nearly 200 letters of support that were filed by the defense. So we will not be hearing her or seeing her live, but we hope to get some updates uh, from reporters in the courtroom. In the meantime, while that testimony guns, uh, continues, I'm joined live in studio now by Brian Buckmeyer, criminal uh, defense attorney, and we still have with us Roger Foley via Skype. So uh, the last witness that we saw was a uh, Chicago police department evidence technician who was at the scene uh, when one of those uh, men who testified earlier um, Jeremy Mayers was taken into custody. Custody. Mayers claims he was choked by Van Dyke and that uh, Van Dyke acted very inappropriately. This was a witness they brought on to sort of mitigate that testimony. So, Roger, uh, did you think that that was effective? That, that he was just, what is he going to say? Is he going to say that he actually saw him choking and he did? He saw him choking Mr. Mayers and he, he didn't report it? He'll be on trial next week if, if he was to say that. This is an example of the blue line. I didn't see anything. Nothing happened. And I don't, I don't, yeah. I mean, and, and of course, <laughs> interestingly, right, I mean, this, this happening the day after the three officers were acquitted uh, for conspiring to cover up the murder. So I think it's sort of interesting how these, uh, you know, how that, how uh, that verdict and this sentencing come back to back. I mean, you can't ignore it. And we know there's supposed to be protesters at the courthouse protesting that verdict um, as well today. But I'll bring Brian on now, you know, talking about some of the witnesses we, we heard from earlier we, and waiting to see whether Van Dyke himself will deliver uh, a statement. There was one victim impact statement on behalf of Laquan McDonald and that was his great uncle who read um, a letter as if it was in the voice of Laquan himself. Certainly adds some drama, certainly adds some emotion. Uh, what do you think of that tactic? I think it's extremely powerful. Uh, if done correctly, it's, it's very heart-wrenching uh, to hear a young child almost kind of like speak from beyond the grave in, in a sense as to what he would have been able to say or what he wished he could have said if he was there. Uh, and that's definitely going to be very tough on the, on the judge uh, who's going to be able to make this decision. Uh, so let's go back to the other family in this, the Van Dyke family. And as we said, Kaylee Van Dyke, uh, Jason Van Dyke's eldest daughter, is now on the stand. And according to reporters in the courtroom, uh, first of all, Van Dyke is getting rather emotional as his daughter speaks and reads uh, a letter that she has written to the judge. She is telling the judge that over the last three years, she's been bullied, teased, picked on, you named it, all because her dad did his job. Of course, this is something we've heard from the Van Dyke family, that this, of course, has been extremely hard on them uh, emotionally, financially, and and, and socially, the children um, have, have had a very tough time in school. Uh, so, um, Roger, uh, on the flip side of this, you know, we hear the Mc McDonald's uh, family's victim impact statement. Um, when we hear from his children and, and presumably his wife, who we'll hear from, and they talk about how this has torn their lives apart, um, how do you think the judge will consider that? I mean, does it change the fact that he was still found guilty of murder? No, I, I don't think it changes the fact, and I think the judge understands it. it's perspective. 
right? The, the, it's their father. It's her father. And of course, she's going to be emotional. And of course, she's going to believe that her father did the right thing. But the reality is, is a jury um, just found him guilty. Well, found him guilty, you know, several months ago. Um, but now it's the judge's uh, job to sentence him. And I think he's going to sentence him accordingly. Yeah, um, you know, as I'm hearing from people in the courtroom, she is talking about how he worked endless shift on days, evenings, even nights to protect the city of the uh, of Chicago, um, saying that, you know, her heart was ripped out of her chest, of course, as you might imagine, the day that Van Dyke uh, was convicted. She says now uh, that he's gone, she feels as if he's left with nothing. Well, of course, you have the McDonald family saying, we don't even have our loved one. You know, he's not gone. He's here, even though he's behind bars. Uh, what do you think, Brian, in terms of hearing from the family member of the defendant and the impact this has had on them? I mean, we've got to expect that it's not going to be easy for anyone in this case. And we even know Laquan McDonald's family and supporters have acknowledged, look, they're victims, too. They didn't do anything wrong. Um, so sh should the judge, you know, what, how much weight should the judge give the testimony of Van Dyke's family members? In terms of weight, I think it, it should have even weight. When, when someone comes up and testifies or, or gives um, any kind of recitation of what they're going through, it should have even weight. But if we're talking about the ability not to see my father or not to see my great nephew, my child, it's very different where one can go to the, go to the prison wait in line and see them behind bars and the other one doesn't have that. So while they might be weighed the same, I think it's very different degrees of levels. Yeah, um, absolutely. You know, she's saying bring him home. I mean, hard to say how, how, how that will play. You got to imagine children, teenagers, whatever it is, of course they want to see their parent home and, and you do feel for them. It's a tough uh, situation for everyone involved. Again, I just want to remind our viewers, we're not seeing any video or audio from the courtroom right now because Van Dyke's oldest daughter, Kaylee, is now on the stand. Uh, she is a minor and has also been asked that she not be broadcast in any uh, capacity. So uh, we are following updates from reporters who are live in this uh, courtroom right now, uh, but that is why we are not uh, uh, seeing anything. Um, so while we wait for this, you know, we don't know who's going to be next, but uh, Jason, what is your, uh, I'm sorry, Roger rather, what is your prediction as to whether Jason Van Dyke uh, will deliver a statement? That, that's up to him and his attorney. Um, I think it would be appropriate in this circumstance, but if he's still maintaining um, that it was part of the job and he felt in fear for his life at that moment, even though I think the video and millions of viewers have seen that video, and uh, he didn't need to shoot him. And he didn't just shoot him once where he said, oh, I, it was a quick accident. He shot him 16 times uh, and, and murdered him. So I don't know what he can say um, other than talking about the stress of the job. So I guess that's a possibility. I mean, he can say sorry, certainly. He can express remorse. And, you know, to my knowledge, that's not something he has really sincerely uh, done yet, at least not in the mind of the McDonald family and Laquan McDonald supporters. Uh, what do you think, Brian, in terms of him speaking? Do you think we'll see it in the next uh, hour or bit of time? I mean, if I'm his defense attorney, I I'm definitely giving him a serious conversation of you should probably talk. You should probably speak, and there needs to be exactly what you're saying, some sort of acceptance of, at the very least, the charges. Maybe not the actions he committed, but the charges and how the jury had found it. Uh, in other areas of law, uh, when it comes to sentencing, they actually go and give you less time, sometimes even in terms of parole or in terms of classification, if you're talking about sex crimes, for those who accept their guilt and those who show some remorse. And when you don't, that's when the judge really hammers you with the sentencing. Uh, Marnie Jo Snyder is rejoining us now. So, Marnie, uh, we were talking about the fact that Kaylee Van Dyke was on the stand reading an emotional letter that she wrote to the judge talking about how hard it has been on her family, how she's been bullied, teased, picked on, you name it, uh, all because her father was doing his job. Uh, she ended the letter by saying, uh, my heart sincerely goes out to the McDonald family, but it's time to bring my dad home. So, uh, Brian and Roger both weighed in on this, uh, but, but the point is, you know, we know it's going to be tough on families on both sides, how much weight should the judge be giving Van Dyke's family members' uh, testimony? I think I think he should give weight uh, to what the family has to say. I mean, Jason Van Dyke is a human being, and he's he's trying to give a sentence that is individualized, um, that takes into account who he is as a person. Um, you know, it, this was the worst night of his life, and I don't think that uh, his humanity shouldn't be respected during the sentencing. I think absolutely. Um, his daughter should be listened to and listened to carefully.
Uh, yeah, um, and we believe from what we're hearing from the courtroom, she did wrap up her testimony, though we haven't gotten a live picture yet. So we'll see whether um, his wife will also take the stand and whether his uh, younger daughter will uh, deliver a statement as well. And then, of course, we'll see whether uh, Jason Van Dyke will. Um, quickly, before we take our next break, uh, Marnie, do you think Jason Van Dyke will get up there and read some words? I think he has to, uh, to really let the judge know that he is sorry, that he is... Um, going to be a law-abiding citizen in the future and that he deserves some mercy from the court. All right. Well, we will see possibly uh, in just the next few minutes. Uh, we are waiting to get that feedback. Quick break when we come back. Much more live from Chicago, the sentencing of former police officer Jason Van Dyke. Welcome back to Law & Crime, the afternoon session. Well, court is back in session in Chicago at the sentencing of Jason Van Dyke. I have guests with me live in studio and via Skype to analyze uh, what's going on there. We do want to say goodbye to one of our guests from earlier, Roger Foley, for being with us. Thanks so much for your excellent insight on this case and others, Roger. Thank you, Stacey. Looking forward to hearing the rest of it. All right. Well, let's take everyone back now into court. Former, uh, rather Van Dyke's former police captain, Leo Crotty, is now on the stand. All right, quickly, while the defense gets ready to call their next witness, uh, some bizarre and surprising testimony there from Ken Watt, a former colleague uh, who worked in court with Jason Van Dyke. I'll start with you, Brian, in studio. I mean, he, he said he, he did what he was trained to do. That's what got him in his mess. And then he said, people get the police they seek. God help the city of Chicago. I mean, I'm not even sure what to make of that testimony. What, what was your reaction? As a defense attorney, in my mind, I'm jumping up and down, and I'm like, what is going on did you not speak to this person before you put them on to talk like like that just seems like poor preparation on their part um and i think the prosecutor did exactly what he should do and he picked up on those exact words and he was like what are you talking about like, right was he trained to shoot men who were laying on the ground yeah. um, that's ludicrous yeah uh marnie uh, your take on that i know you you agree it was rather uh, bizarre as well are trained to do, then God help the city of Chicago, because a jury already found that this was excessive force and second-degree murder. And it, it is an indictment in some ways of the police department, and I do not think that that was the witness to defend them. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, we got to get back live into court now. The next witness has taken the stand. All right, uh, testimony just wrapping up from uh, Dean Angelo Sr., a former fraternal or police president, was president who was president of the uh, union at the time uh, when Van Dyke was charged. She first met Van Dyke when he bonded out, um, and he talked about the fact that Van Dyke is not the monster that people made him out to be, that the media made him out to be. He's religious, he's a hard worker, he's a dad. This wasn't something he set out to do. Um, at times, though, you know, he almost contradicted himself, and the uh, on cross examination, the prosecutors, you know, brought up the fact they never that that uh, Angela never worked with Van Dyke when he was a cop in the field. It was only after the fact that they met. Um, Brian uh, Buckmeyer with me here in studio. Marnie Joe Snyder still uh, via Skype. I mean, I don't know if I'm being too cynical. Stop me if I am, but I'm sort of feeling like. Could the defense not get any better witnesses to testify on his behalf? I mean, because between this and the guy we heard from before, uh, Ken Watt, who had worked with him in court and made those kind of bizarre statements, I'm not sure how much these witnesses are, are helping their client. What do you think, Marnie? I mean, they obviously went all in. Uh, they decided that they were going to attack the verdict, um, and they were going to kind of speak about being a police officer generally. Uh, they weren't going to let this be an indictment of the department. And they're going to put everything on the line where I would have called people to speak to who he is as a human being. Um, everyone that talks at a sentencing is technically a witness, but that doesn't need, mean it needs to be this boring question and answer. You can let someone speak from the heart. And I would have concentrated on who Jason Van Dyke is instead of trying to constantly defend the police department. It always feels like conflict, like the FOP paid for these lawyers. Yeah. Uh, I want to get Brian's reaction, too, but we've got to take a quick break. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
Heidi uh, Kuffner, Van Dyke's sister, heaping praise on him as a person, about his character, how good he was to the family, kept everyone calm, talked about how this has impacted her, her parents, Van Dyke's children. Um, I, I don't know. What did you make of this uh, testimony, Mark? Uh, well, let me start with Brian here in studio. Um, you know, on the one hand, she's, you know, saying what she feels about her brother. On the other, you've got all these people reacting in real time on social media saying, yeah, but he killed a kid. Yeah, it's, it's extremely difficult for me as, a, as many things, public defender, a black male, to, uh, to not be a little bit jaded when I hear some of these things that my clients don't get the um, testimony or the, or the thoughtfulness that they're getting. And as a defense attorney, I'm not hearing that the death of this child affected my brother. The death of this child affected my colleague. Right. It's always skirting the issue. Right. He lost his livelihood. He can't go out in public. He's depressed. But right, we haven't heard anything that suggests, you know, he, he will regret this decision, you know, for the rest of his life because of what it means. I mean, Marnie, do you agree? And, and what can we make, Marnie, of the fact that uh, the sister, I mean, clearly at the end was kind of reading a statement, but was seemed to be reading notes um, when she was asked, you know, basic questions about how are your parents dealing with this? How has Jason been? Uh, is that something you would counsel clients to do, bring notes? Well, I think, first of all, Brian gave the sentiment okay. perfectly. Um, but as far as presentation, I mean, I would actually rather have a witness be more upfront about it and say I've read a statement. Um, I, I'd like to read a statement about my brother and how much I care about him. Um, you, you know, the judges know that people get nervous in court, and that way you can be heartfelt and put it together instead of being interrupted by a lawyer the whole time. This is so disjointed. It's a very strange presentation. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, Will the judge be swayed by that? I mean, probably not. I'm sure the judge has, has seen this before and has to understand that people, you know, maybe get nervous or whatever it is. Uh, Jason Van Dyke's father, Owen Van Dyke, is now on the stand. Let's go in live. Owen Van Dyke, Jason Van Dyke's father, obviously asking for leniency, saying his son is not the monster the media makes him out to be, and then and the prosecutor makes him out to be, and then also going on to say at the end here that um, he doesn't believe his son was tried under the right guidelines. Uh, a little strange. It seems like we're well beyond that uh, part in this case by then. Uh, do you guys agree, Marnie? Yes, I do. Um, and I, I don't care whether I am thinking about appeal or mounting an appeal, then I just don't put anyone up to speak at sentencing that can't speak to uh, someone taking responsibility or having feelings of remorse or at least being sorry that something happened and reaching out uh, to a victim's family. So I just really don't know why uh, they were put on the stand um, they should have been put on the stand to say that they love Jason Van Dyke, they care about what happens to him, and they want him home. I didn't even hear that. Um, so it's it's just not, I don't see that it's going well for the defense, but maybe they know something about the judge that I don't. I mean, it's a good point. I mean, and all of these witnesses from the family going on about his history, his schooling, the diverse community he grew up in. I mean, how relevant is that at, at this point, you know, Brian? It is to some extent, but I, I agree with Marty that the, the way in which they do it is completely wrong. I'll, I'll say it flat out. The police officers probably should not have been there to testify. I would have gone strictly with just the family members, and the first words that come out of their mouths should have been them turning to the family of the victim, uh, Mr. McDonald, and saying, I'm sorry. My son, my brother, my brother-in-law committed this horrible act, and we understand and we feel for you. But let me tell you about the man that he is and why I'm asking for leniency. Right. And no one said anything about the McDonald family except the daughter, who, you know, wasn't on camera. We, we read, uh, you know, some comments about what she said. Uh, I just want to say the current uh, Fraternal Order of Police presidents now on the stand. So now we're back to the cops. We were talking about this briefly. I mean, the order of this, they're going uh, cop, family member, cop, family member, family member. You know, do you think it's a, a little bit out of sync? I'm getting, you know, stuff about his personal character and then back about how, you know, he did whatever he could to protect the FOP, right? Marty? Yes, I would have put on the most emotional people either first and ended with Van Dyke or put them on last um, so that they can plead for leniency. Um, that emotional part, uh, it, you know, has to really impact the judge and I would have way less police officers. Yeah, I mean, it's like just when you kind of start to hear something interesting, whether it's the sister or the brother-in-law, then we, we go back to something perhaps a little drier. Uh, okay, I want to thank both of you for being me, with me here this afternoon. Brian Buck, Mar Marnie Joe Snyder, it's been great having your analysis. We do have the Fraternal Order of Police current president on the stand. After that, it is likely Jason Van Dyke himself will deliver a statement. Stick around. Aaron Keller coming up with the Daily Debrief. He will take you back live to Chicago. You won't want to miss
miss it. We'll be right back after this short break here on the Long Time Trial Network.